Genesis 41, and then we left off at verse, let's see, 15. We'll start off at verse 15. The Bible says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he, oh, excuse me, 15, I'm reading 14. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. Okay, meaning Pharaoh says to Joseph that self-explanatory, I dreamed a dream. No one can explain or interpret the dream to me, but I've heard stuff about you. I've heard people, what they said about you, that you can interpret dreams. Verse 16, and Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So notice in verse 16, Joseph uh, answers Pharaoh by saying, I'm not the one who can interpret the dreams. I'm not the one. He says right here that uh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh the answer uh, that has peace, that has peace. Now, notice right here that Joseph, it's very different from how he interpreted the dream uh, for the baker. He didn't just uh, go all out saying that you're going to die. It's a negative sermon. It's a negative message. It's not Joel Osteen positive. Notice right here, he goes with respect at verse 16. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So when we meet uh, people who are in charge of our communities, that's why we address them with respect. To the judge, we will say, your honor. So even though there are wicked people in charge of our system, uh, they're no, uh, we have to realize they're no exception from back in the Old Testament. There were plenty of wicked pagan rulers that time. A lot of people want to try to go around Romans 13 or other passages that because these rulers are corrupt, we don't have to respect them. We don't have to honor them. Actually, you still have to. It's like uh, we have to understand this. That doesn't mean that we don't criticize them, that we don't uh, call them out on their wrongdoings. No, John the Baptist did that with Herod. We've seen that case. We've seen the case with even today. If there are people uh, who want to criticize the uh, government leaders, they will do so. But if they're like in a formal setting where they're talking in front of a courtroom, they will use the address and they will use respectful phrases. Why? Because that is proper. That is right to do. So remember, there's a time and place for everything. Just because you're honoring and respecting someone, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, you elevate them at a level where you don't reproach them, you don't rebuke them, you don't even criticize them. All right? So there's always a time and place for everything. That's just common sense in everyday life. If we can think that way without the Bible, and there are lost people who criticize our current leaders uh, without the Bible, but if they were in a courtroom setting, or if they were in a Senate hearing or, something, or a committee, they will use address that will uh, respect the person. They will do that. Okay? So we Christians should be able to do better with the Bible. Okay, if they can do it without the Bible, that should be common sense. Now, look at this example at the book of Daniel, chapter 4. Daniel, chapter 4. Ne Nebuchadnezzar, he, uh, he was a wicked king, and he was very cruel and scary. Daniel, when he was speaking to the king, he came with bad news. But when he came with bad news, he just didn't call him out and said, uh, because you got a pride issue, the Lord's going to cut you down. He didn't do it that way. As a matter of fact, he was very silent for a long time. Why? Because uh, he realizes that Nebuchadnezzar has the power. He's a head honcho. So Daniel, he's not going to be stupid in getting his head cut off because Nebuchadnezzar, he could just pop his head any moment and get upset. Let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 4. So we have to realize the same thing with our leaders. We have to use wisdom. We have to understand the same case. Let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 4. And then uh, notice right here what, how Daniel uh, responds at verse 19, verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, 
was a stoning for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. So notice right here, Daniel, he didn't answer Nebuchadnezzar immediately because he was troubled by the dream's interpretation. It was bad news for Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 19, notice how Daniel responds. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. That's very wise. So notice right here how he addresses the ruler. The bad news of this dream, I would prefer to go to your enemies. All right, not to you. Joseph, he says to Pharaoh, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. See that? So we have to consider the same thing uh, in times with our rulers. But notice there are times that they should be called out. Notice in Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Notice how they answered. In verse Daniel chapter 3, and then we'll read at verse 16. Isn't this interesting? Daniel, he was very careful and wise. But in this case, Daniel 3, 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. And then verse 17, they call, it, uh, they call him out. They preach against Nebuchadnezzar. That he got furious. So remember, there's a time and a place for everything. You have to look at the context of every scenario. There's a time that we have to uh, submit honor and respect. But then there are times when you have to call it out. You have to call it out. All right, let's go back to Genesis 41. We're going to go to Genesis 41. It's like uh, it's any type of leadership that is set up. That's just common sense. It's any type of leadership that's set up. For example, let's say that your wife's submitting to the husband, right? So you're supposed to honor, you're supposed to obey, submit to the husband. But then if, the, if that man keeps slapping you around in the face, you're not going to call him out for what he does? You know, hey, what you're doing is wrong. You're hurting me. You know, that's really evil of you. You're not going to call him out on that one if he just uh, abuses you like that. So... That's why we have, to, uh, we have to understand that in honor and submission and respect, that doesn't mean that we never call them out. All right? We never call them out for something that's evil, or especially when God tells you to call them out. So remember that. Think about it. Uh, we, see, we see that with pastors, honor, submit, and respect, right? But if the pastor uh, does a sin in the church that's sexual, and then the whole church knows about it, you're going to honor and submit? Or are you going to say, hey, uh, what you did was wrong. Why don't you address it to the church? Now, see, it, it, that's with any leadership. All right? In the home, in the church, and in government. Okay. So if we think of it that way, that's just common sense in life with leadership, then we can understand the same thing with government rulers right here when we read Genesis 41. All right? All right, let's go back right here at this passage. Uh, verse 17, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, in my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. Now, you can guess right here that he's going to be repeating his dream. I've already explained his dream in previous verses before, so many of, uh, much of this will be self-explanatory, but I will uh, explain each and every word from the verse like I promised to you, but I'm going to abbreviate it. That way I don't dull you. Uh, that way I don't bore you. So let's read the verses and then, I'll, and then see if my explanations match with the verse, all right? Verse 18, And behold, there came up out of the river seven kine, fat-fleshed and well-favored, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them, poor and very ill-favored, and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill-favored kine did eat up the first seven fat kine. And when they had eaten them up, it... Uh, it could not be known <coughs> that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favored as at the beginning, so I awoke. All right, explaining from 17 through 21, see if it matches up. Pharaoh, he speaks to Joseph, saying that within my dream, lo and behold, look what I saw. I was standing on the banks of the river, and lo and behold, what came out of the river were just uh, seven cows, and they were very fat, and they were well-favored. 
A lot of people would buy these cows. And they were feeding off in a meadow. And lo and behold, there were seven other cows that came up after the fat flesh cow. But these seven other cows, they're poor and they're, they're ill-favored. People, uh, people wouldn't favor them as well. They were very skinny. And I, so skinny, I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. I never saw something so bad in all my life, that skinny. And then uh, the lean and then the ill-favored cows, they ate up uh, the first seven fat cows that were before them. Uh, that, came, uh, that came up before them. When, they, when the skinny cows ate up the fat cows, it couldn't be known that they ate them. And because they were still very ill-favored, they were still very skinny, so you couldn't tell after they ate them up. As they were still skinny like the beginning, and then I woke up from my dream. All right, verse 22. And I saw my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk full and good. And behold, seven ears with their withered thin and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. All right, explaining every word. Uh, Pharaoh says he sees in his dream, and lo and behold, seven ears. And remember, this is uh, grain right here. This is referring to the grain in one stalk. And it was full and it was good, successful grain. And then lo and behold, there are seven other ears that are withered. They are very thin. And then the east, they are being blasted by the east wind. And this east wind, it just came up after the seven uh, skinny, ears of, uh, skinny ears of grain came out. And then the thin ears of grain, they ate up the seven good ears of grain. Uh, I told this to uh, my magicians, but no, none of them could explain it, declare it to me. Verse 25, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now notice right here, Joseph, he says to Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's dream that he had is one dream. So what, he doesn't say dreams here, he says dream singular. So it's a collective idea. The two separate dreams that Pharaoh had, Joseph addresses it as one collective thing. But he also explains that it's, it has one meaning right here. It's one. God shows Pharaoh what he's going to do. That's the reason why he gave you these dreams, Pharaoh. Verse 26. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good years are seven years. The dream is one. Joseph says that the seven good cows represent seven years. And then look how the Lord has play on words here. He has this kind of habit. The seven good years are seven years. See that? It's just kind of funny. Sometimes the Lord does that. He has a play on words. So the seven good years of grain, they're representing seven years as well. They're both one dream. Verse 27, and the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty years blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. So then uh, Joseph now explains the other seven that are skinny and thin and ill-favored. Verse 27, the seven thin and ill-favored cows uh, that came up after uh, the fat cows, they, they also represent seven years. The seven uh, ears of grain that are empty, that are thin, skinny, basically nothing, with being blasted by the east wind, are representing seven years of famine. This is the thing, verse 28, this is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do showeth unto Pharaoh. So Joseph says, here's the thing that uh, that I spoke to Pharaoh. What is he about to speak to Pharaoh? What God is about to do, he's going to show to Pharaoh. So basically the idea is in verse 28, uh, even though it kind of sounds a little bit redundant or wordy, the idea is what I'm about to say, God's about to show you. Verse 29, Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. So verse 29 and 30, Joseph says, uh, look, that's the idea about the word behold again. Look, or hey, 
There's going to come seven years of great plenty, prosperity throughout all the land of Egypt. But after those seven years of plenty, there's going to come out seven years of famine. And all those prosperous years, uh, the roaring 20s in America are going to be forgotten due to the Great Depression in America. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. But I see Genesis 41 as repeating economics of our society. All right, you wonder, why, um, you, you wonder why we're going through the mess we're going through. Because we had prosperous years before. Usually, <clears throat> how I see in history, nearly, uh, this is not part of the lesson, but just a little nugget. But what I, one thing I notice about history is that when there's a time of great prosperity without God, the, the nation suffers after that the consequences. And they go through really bad times. They go through really bad times. You might say, why? Because they're, how do I say this? It's kind of like, you know, when you're borrowing money and you're use, using your credit card uh, for, and then uh, just spending so much and then enjoying all the luxuries that you use on that credit card, but you're going by a credit card. You have to pay it back one day. And then when you pay it back, you're going to pay it back very hard. Yeah. That's what happens when you're without God. Yeah. You're going by some kind of borrowed credit card system. Okay. Now, that's not, it's a no-brainer with our government. They are borrowing money, and they're even borrowing something that's empty that has no value. Yeah. And the nation and everybody is surely paying for that. Yeah. If you think you can run away from it by migrating, you're not going to run away from it. You're only going by borrowed time again. All right? Pretty soon, there's no place to run. It's better to face the music with God. That's the best thing to do. Okay, anyways, uh, going back right here. <clears throat> we see right here that at verse 30, again, he's saying that all the prosperous years are going to be forgotten in Egypt's land because a famine will consume, it will devour uh, all the land of Egypt. So that's the idea where it matches with... Uh, uh, never mind. Let's continue on in verse 31. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. So Joseph says that the prosperous, the plentiful years, seven years that you're going to have, is going to not be known in the land of Egypt. They're not going to even recognize it. Uh, by reason of, the reason why is because of the fa famine, the seven years of heavy famine that will follow it. It's going to be sore and very grievous. That's the idea of verse 21, what Pharaoh says that I was, going to try, that I was trying to say. At verse 21, Pharaoh said, you know, you couldn't tell uh, that they ate up the fat cows. The fat cows are just not known at all. It's just been wiped out the memory. You couldn't tell at all any trace of that. Why? Because they were still very ill-favored. The famine is still very grievous. That's the idea. So Joseph is trying to interpret that for Pharaoh at verse 21, uh, combined with verse 31. Verse 32, And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. One of the most important verses on hermeneutics that you want to mark down. Okay, this is another one. In verse 32, Joseph says, uh, The reason why the dream was doubled to you, Pharaoh, twice is because the thing is established by God. What, uh, how the interpretation is done, what's going to come out of that dream, is, go is established. It's going to be confirmed by God. And God will make sure it comes to pass very soon. So the idea is when God puts a stamp of approval or confirmation, what does that mean? That means it's done twice. That's what confirming is. We have to understand that when the Lord repeats something, it's very important. That means it will be established. It is done. One of the most important rules. Okay, go to Job 33. Job 33. When you see something repeated in Scripture, keep your ears open. When you see a word or, a, or an interpretation that's repeated, then you better mark that down. That's very important in biblical hermeneutics. Uh, the reason why many cults come out with their wrong doctrines is they base it off of one verse, you might recall. It's always something abstract and one verse. 
If I were to, a uh, quick example, all right, I don't want to spend a long time in biblical hermeneutics, but I could do that. It's a very interesting stuff. But the short version, for example, is Matthew 16. How are Peter upon this rock? I will build my church. So that's one verse the Catholics use that Peter's got to be the rock of the church. However, the problem is, is that that's just one verse and it can go in different meanings because we could, uh, how do they not know that Jesus said that you're Peter, but upon this rock, Jesus is pointing himself, I will build my church. Uh, the interpretation can go either way. Now, in our case, the reason why is twice or thrice it is established. So then we compare that with John 2. We compare that with Peter's own statement at 1 Peter 2. We compare that with Paul's own statement at 1 Corinthians 10. So we see right here the proper interpretation, Jesus Christ is the rock. But the Catholics only go by one verse. That's how you develop a wrong doctrine. Uh, Bible believers is scripture with scripture, and then from there we can figure out the proper and the correct interpretation. <clears throat> so one of the most important rules in biblical hermeneutics is repetition, all right? Twice established, you have to look at that. All right, go to Job 33. Notice in verse 14, the Bible says, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet what? Man perceiveth it not. No kidding. No kidding. I mean, no matter how many times, you ever showed the verse to somebody, and you would even show them twice or thrice, but man perceiveth it not? And you're like, how can you be so blind? Right? You show them what's the right doctrine, and you're reading the verse. You're not telling them. You're just showing them the verse right in front of their face. They just don't see it. All right. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Look at what Jesus said here. Look at what Jesus said here. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Look at Matthew chapter 18. And then we'll read verse 16, Matthew 18 and verse 16. The Bible says here, uh, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, what? Every word may be established. Look at verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So God takes repetition very seriously. Two or three times, and that means it's a firm deal. I mean, you ever told your child, don't touch that. And then the second time, do not touch that. What does that mean when you give the second time? It's an established fact that you better not touch it. Not that, well, you can interpret it differently. No, some parent might get upset at the child and say, no, you know exactly what I meant. All right. Uh, we're going to look at one example of a doctrine that people belittle. Let's look at Mark 9. Mark 9. Mark 9. Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses, they boast so much about knowing the Bible, explaining the Bible, and they love to do debates. Well, for people who boast about knowing the Bible and doctrine, they sure are poor in really knowing their Bible because God repeated three times about the doctrine of a literal burning hell. Yes. How can you deny that doctrine, especially if it's repeated three times? Look at Mark chapter 9. Oh, by the way, your modern Bible versions dropped the repetition as well. They got rid of the, the tools of biblical hermeneutics, God's method and style of doctrine. All right, look at Mark 9, 44. Where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Verse 46, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 48, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Okay, that should be plain. There is a literal burning hell. Go back. Genesis 41. Amazing how many people deny that, though, right? How many people deny that? <clears throat> Look at Genesis 41. And then uh, we will read verse 33. Verse 33. Genesis 41, 33. The Bible says, Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. So Joseph, he says to Pharaoh, after explaining the dream, he advises Pharaoh. So because of this dream, Pharaoh, therefore, why don't you look out for a man who's very smart and who's uh, discreet? 
put him in charge over the land of Egypt. Make sure Pharaoh does this, and then have him appoint different officers, people in charge over the land, who will make sure that they will save up the fifth part of Egypt's prosperous years, their plentiful gain, take a fifth part of that, save it up for storage. Verse 35, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. So that fifth part, they're going to gather all that food during those good years, those plentiful seven years that come and follow. He says, uh, lay up, that's storing up, the grain, corn means grain, remember, under Pharaoh's hand, under his guidance, make sure that he's keeping charge of that, keeping an eye out on that. And then let those officers keep, protect, maintain the food in the cities. Verse 36, and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. So the food is going to be uh, stored up for that land, saved up as backup, for the land of Egypt against the seven years of famine, which is going to take place in the land of Egypt. That way, the land of Egypt does not perish. It does not die out due to the famine. Verse 37, And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? So uh, what happened... The incident that occurred that Pharaoh saw and the servants saw in front of their faces, they were very pleased with what happened. So that's why Pharaoh says to his servants, are we going to find anyone like this in where the Spirit of God is? That's a good testimony. All right. Uh, the type of Christ right here, Hebrews 1.9. Hebrews 1.9. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9. The anointing oil, we all know, uh, symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9. Above all the brethren of Joseph and above all the people, Joseph has been shown and manifested to have the anointing spirit of God upon him. Above all the uh, magicians who tried to explain the dream. Jesus Christ as well above everybody else. He was anointed with the oil of gladness and symbolizing the anointing oil, the Holy Spirit. Notice right here, verse 9, verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of, glad of gladness above thy fellows. So that's really good. That's really good. All right, let's go back right here. Verse 39, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Forasmuch as God hath uh, showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. So Pharaoh says to Joseph, Forasmuch, so notice right here, all uh, that's self explanatory. Man, that's a hard English word. No, it's just space it out. Forasmuch, you know, so it's, you already defined that hard English word for you. You just need to t study it a bit, okay? So that's self-explanatory. For as much as God showed you all these things in the dreams, look, there's no one as discreet and wise as you. Verse 40, Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. So the idea is, Pharaoh says to, Jos uh, Pharaoh says to Joseph, you're going to be over my house. And according to your word, all my people are going to be ruled. Just me, only in the throne, I'm going to be greater than you. Now, there's a lot of gleanings over here already. All right, verse 39, God showed Joseph all things. Jesus Christ was shown by God all things as well. John 5, 20. John chapter 5. And then we'll read verse 20. The Bible says here, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. 
and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. So notice right here, the Father, God, shows the Son all things. Another one is, look at 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Pharaoh said, none as wise as thou art. Because Joseph had that hidden wisdom. So wise, Jesus Christ, also the hidden wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So the pagans, the Greeks, the Gentiles love wisdom. Joseph, uh, uh, those pagan Egyptians, they love wisdom, and they saw something. And then we see right here that at verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So God is made unto them wisdom as well. All right. All right, we're going to uh, look at another passage, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And then we'll look at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And then we'll read verse 3. Uh, notice right here that the sun is set over the house. Remember, Pharaoh said, over all my house you'll be set. Right. Notice right here that Joseph, like a son, is set over all of Pharaoh's house, but Jesus Christ is the son who's set over all of the father's house. Hebrews 3, 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. All right, let's go back. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, actually, there are two more. 1 Thessalonians 2. You notice a lot of gleanings here, right, just from those verses? 1 Thessalonians 2. Pharaoh said to Joseph, according to your word, everything will be done. So is the same with Jesus Christ. According to his word, everything will be done. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. The Bible says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which, fec which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Notice the context right here is in Christ in verse 14. So the topic is in Christ. All right. Another one is 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 28. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Pharaoh said, Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. So the Father is one that's greater than the Son. And he's the one who gives the son his throne, hands over his throne. All right, so second in charge, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him, the father, that put all things under him. The father gives him all of that, that God may be all in all. You're going to find out later on, Joseph is put in the second chariot as well. The second chariot. We're, we're going to see that later on, but that matches up with this same verse, okay? Second in charge. All right, let's go back. Genesis. We're turning to Genesis 41. Notice right here that at verse 38 through 40, we already covered all of this, all right? That's already a huge chunk over there. Notice in verse 41, verse 41, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. So Pharaoh says to Joseph, Look at right here. See this? I set you in charge over everything in the land of Egypt. All right. So Jesus Christ is set as well over all the land. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew chapter 28. And then we'll read verse 19. Jesus Christ, notice that he tells his disciple that basically everything that is given in the land is uh, given to him. He set in charge over all the land. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. See that? All right, so that's Matthew 28, 18. That's Matthew 28, 18, excuse me. All right, so I put the wrong verse right there. That's why in verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations. So because he has all that power over all the land or all the nations, 
he wants them to teach all those nations. Okay, so uh, let's put 18. I apologize for that one. All right, 28 and 18. Go back to Genesis 41, and then we'll go to the next verse there. Pharaoh continues on to Joseph at verse 42. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand. So Pharaoh takes off his ring from his hand and then he places it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. So he, he dressed him up. That's the idea about arrayed. He dressed him up, uh, put on him vestures that were fine linen. And then he also put a gold chain around his neck. Now look at the wording here. This is crazy. Look at Luke 15. Luke 15. Here we see a father putting upon a ring on his son as well as fine garments. That's crazy. All right, the wording right here. Look at Luke chapter 15. And then we'll look at verse 22. But the father, see that? said to his servants concerning his son, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. All right, that's crazy, the word. All right, go back here. Oh, oh, uh, if that's not enough, look at verse 24. Isn't this? For this my son was dead and is alive again. All right, but anyway, go back to Genesis 41. Genesis 41. Pretty crazy, huh? The author has something in mind here. The author has something in mind. Let's look at Genesis 41. And you know what I mean by the author, right? Yeah. You know what I mean. He has something in mind. There's no way the other authors could connect the dots like that. All right, Genesis 41. Continue on at verse 43. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. So matching up with second in charge again, right? So Pharaoh uh, made Joseph ride in his second chariot. Look at this. Isn't this crazy? And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Uh, notice right here that when Joseph's name was announced, they cried out to the people as they announced Joseph's name to make way for him. They all bowed the knee as well. They cried out, bow the knee. And then Pharaoh made Joseph ruler over... Uh, made, Excuse me. Pharaoh made Joseph ruler over all the land of Egypt. So we're going to look at two passages, Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 9 through 10. Philippians 2, 9 through 10. The other one is Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. And then we'll look at verse 33. Ezekiel chapter 20. And then uh, we'll read verse 33. Notice right here that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. Bow the knee, right? Isn't that crazy? Bow the knee. And then the verse says, every knee will bow. All right. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Man, that's crazy. Yeah. All right, now Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33. Notice that in spite of pagan nations who may not bow down to a Hebrew like Joseph, they were made to bow. So uh, God will do the same thing through his son, Jesus Christ. Nations might reject him and scoff at him, but they will be made to bow before him. And Jesus will rule over all the land of Egypt, so to speak, a type of the world. Jesus will, will rule over all the world, even if the world does not like it. They will be made to bow. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with the mighty hand and with the stretched out arm and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. If that's not enough, the very next verse... Uh, in 34, he's going to bring back his family, his people. So Joseph does the same thing, right? Brings back his family, his people. There's a lot of typology right here. There's no doubt. All right, going back to Genesis 41. Genesis 41. 
We'll look at verse 44. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. So Pharaoh says to Joseph, hey, I'm Pharaoh. Without you, because of my authority being Pharaoh, without you, no person will be able to even lift up his own hand or foot. They're not able to do anything. That's the meaning. They're not able to do anything in all the land of Egypt without you. So is the same with Jesus Christ. Go to John 15, 5. John 15, 5. Without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Crazy, isn't it? And the wording right here, John 15, 5. John 15, 5. Notice what Jesus said. You can't do anything uh, without him. John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. All right? All right, let's go back to Genesis 41 again. So many pictures here. Genesis 41. If that's not enough, verse 45, run the aisles here. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneo. Hallelujah, man. Strongest typology right here. You're talking about, what, what are you talking about? So Pharaoh calls Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneo. You know what that means? Savior of the world. John 3.16. Go to John 3.16. Insane. Now don't tell me that all of this, we're trying to stretch things after that. There is no doubt. There is no doubt. Jesus had in mind that Joseph would be his typology. The, the author had all this in mind. John chapter 3, verse 16, the famous passage that represents the Savior of the world. The passage reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's the Savior of the whole world, Jesus Christ. All right, going back to Genesis 41. Genesis 41. All right, let's read the next part of verse 45. The next part of verse 45. And he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. So uh, Pharaoh gives Joseph a wife. The wife's name is Asenath. She's the daughter of a priest of On in Egypt. The priest of On in Egypt, his name is Potiphar. And then Joseph, he, was, he went out throughout all the land of Egypt. He's going, uh, he's taking care of business. Uh, this is another thing to think about. So he marries an Egyptian. Joseph marries an Egyptian named Asenath, who's a black woman. Now, Asenath, it means basic, uh, it's devoted to Neith. That's the idea. So she is devoted to or one of the gods of Egypt. So that's what her name means. And then Potiphar as well. Potiphar means devoted to the sun. And the location she's at in On, the Greeks, they call that Heliopolis, actually, believe it or not. So that's a, like a higher university-centered city, yeah. believe it or not. So that's where she came from, but she was delivered from all of that now, I don't know if any of you could shout about this, if you picture yourself right here, but then basically, you got married to that man, and where you used to submit to the pagan world, came out from the pagan world, now you found someone else to submit to. The wife submits to the husband, right? Well, this wife right here, and you can picture yourself, now submits to this man. And this man changed your entire life right here. The Lord Jesus Christ, amen. He sure did that. Now you submit to him, and then your night turned into day. The world that you, you used to submit to, now you submit to Jesus Christ. You serve a different master, praise the Lord. All right, uh, we're going to uh, see a couple of these examples. Let's look at Song of Solomon chapter 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Great typology. A lot of uh, preachers and even scholars would uh, recognize that Song of Solomon is a relationship of Christ and the church, they would say. Christ and the church. Well, then the wife, she's actually a black woman. 
And this black woman, she marries Solomon, which pictures Jesus Christ. Man, look at the typology matching up. Joseph, he married, remember, a black woman. All right, let's look at uh, Song of Solomon chapter 1. Notice right here in verse 5 that uh, the woman says, I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me, because I am black. Now, some dumb black Hebrew Israelites, they use it, some of them, not all, will use this verse as proof that Jesus was black, all right, or Solomon was black at verse 5, all right? Well, that's dumb. Notice right here, it's definitely the wife. I am black, but comely. Notice addressing, O ye daughters of Jerusalem. As the curtains of who? Solomon. Just read, all right? <laughs> they don't read, all right. All right, anyway, going back, going back. Great typology of the wife uh, submitting to the husband as the church submits to Jesus Christ. And then you can also add Ephesians 5 with that one if you want to, all right? Ephesians 5. All right, because it shows the wife and husband submitting, but then it shows the church and Christ. So it, accompliments that, uh, it accompanies that. All right, now notice right here that she's daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Potiphar means devoted to the son. Well, she's no longer serving uh, that son anymore, or that sun god in Egypt. She's serving uh, the son now. Go to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi 4. Jesus Christ is called the son of righteousness. And S-U-N. S-U-N even. All right. All right, let's look at Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, Malachi 4, 2. The Bible reads here, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. All right, go back. Go back. Too many typologies right here. There's no doubt. Let me know if I'm cut off, okay? All right. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to look at verse... So let's see here. We are now at verse 51. All right, 51. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God said he hath made me forget all my toil and, my father's, and all my father's house. So Joseph, he called the name of his firstborn son Manasseh. Because Manasseh means this. Because God, he said made me forget all my troubles, all the struggles that I went through, and then all the hard times in my family's home. Uh, there's actually a really good sermon about uh, where is your Manasseh, actually. It's a pretty good sermon. So basically, all the bitterness or the pain that you went through, it's forgotten. It's forgotten because of God's goodness. But then uh, we're, we, stay on, we stay on the bitterness, on the pain. We don't let the joy or God's blessing drown that out that we can forget the pain. Good sermon, right? That, that'll be a sermon right there. All right, but anyway, uh, let's see right here. La, 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 la. Okay, so uh, Joseph, uh, he was able to forget after the toil. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And then we'll look at verse 11, Isaiah chapter 53. And then uh, we'll read verse 11. Notice the prophecy of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. But look at this. Throughout this toil, kind of like the toil at Genesis 41, Isaiah 53, 11, he shall see of the travail of his soul, but notice the result, and shall be what? Satisfied. So the satisfaction drowns out the toil. The joy drowns out the toil, just like Manasseh, all right? Uh, Joseph said, uh, he made me forget all my toil because of God's goodness and blessing. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. And actually, I skipped several verses. I'm sorry. All right, so 46. We'll go to verse 46. And Joseph was what? 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. So Joseph, he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt that time. 
And Joseph, he went out from Pharaoh's presence and then got to work. He went throughout all the land of Egypt, you know, saving up the food, counting, and taking charge of everything. Now, don't tell me that uh, there is no the author behind the scenes. 30 years old, when he began that work, who also began his work that time? Jesus Christ, Luke 3, 23, at the age of 30. At the age of 30. What in the world, right? There's no doubt. Luke chapter 3 and verse 23. Luke 3, 23. As a matter of fact, some of these things are so coincidental that scholars, they cannot dismiss them as mere coincidence. Right. They can see that there is something the author is deliberately doing. So you know how they, so, so you know what they do? Yeah. So rather than seeing a divine hand, that's their proof text that, see, these were authors copycatting each other. That is extremely wicked. When you prove Noah's flood, then they say, oh, uh, right here, this proves out that there was some kind of uh, evolution, you know, <laughs> or some kind of ice age or something like that. So whenever you have an explanation for something, uh, the evolutionists or the wicked ones, they'll always, the scholars, they'll always drown it out with their other explanation. Yeah. So that's extremely wicked. All right, Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. All right. So Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry. All right, go to Genesis 41. Genesis 41, and then we'll look at verse 47. In the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. So in the seven plentiful years, the good years, the earth was able to bring forth, was able to... Uh, give a lot of handfuls. Uh, uh, so that's the idea, a lot, handful, right, of food. Verse 48, And he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. All right, the idea is, Joseph, he starts to gather all the food during the seven years. Remember, the total is a fifth part. And then he lays up, or he stores up the food in the cities. Uh, the food of the field that uh, was uh, bringing forth a lot of plenty. And it was around every city there, the plenty, uh, the plentiful food. And then he made sure that he la laid he up in the same. He stored them up the same way. So the idea is every city he went to, basically a fifth part of that, and then he stores them up the same way. Verse 49, and Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. So it was so plentiful, the food, the grain, or the corn in the land of Egypt, that it was as plentiful as the sand of the sea. That's a metaphor, obviously. So it's just so much. So much that Joseph stopped counting. He left numbering. So he couldn't count anymore. It was just way too much, for it was without number. Verse 50, and unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. So Joseph was able to have two sons born to him before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bare unto him. These two sons came, obviously, from Asenath, who's the daughter of Potiphera, a priest in the location of On. She gave birth uh, for him. All right, now verse 52, because I explained 51, verse 52, the second son. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God uh, hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So uh, he calls the name of his second son Ephraim, because he says God caused me to become very fruitful in the land of my pain, in the land of my affliction. All right, so uh, let's go to Isaiah 53. Again, Isaiah 53, and then John 15. I want you to go to John 15 and Isaiah 53. Notice in the land of Jesus' affliction, where they afflicted him, right? This is crazy. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, and then go to John 15. Isaiah 53, John 15. Notice that uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, and then we'll read verse 4. Four. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, uh, stricken, smitten of God, and what? Afflicted. So he was afflicted in that land, Jesus' own land. 
But even though he was afflicted, look what happened at verse 2. Verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a what? Tender plant. So notice that he's about to be like a plant that's about to bring forth fruit. But during affliction, during his time there, no attention, right? At verse 2. It's not that fruitful. The same thing with Joseph. He was that little plant in his land of affliction. He wasn't fruitful yet, but he's becoming fruitful. Jesus Christ as that plant, not fruitful yet, but he's becoming fruitful. He's just starting. Notice this is as a root out of a dry ground. Grow up before as a tender plant. That shows he's starting. What does he become? John 15. John 15. Notice right here in verse uh, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth what? Much fruit. Jesus Christ is able to bring forth much fruit now. All right, going back, going back. Crazy, that book. It's very interesting, crazy. Genesis chapter 41. All right, uh, let me finish all this quickly, all right? Wait, I don't have time, so let me finish this up. There's so much here, right? Like I told you. 53. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Self-explanatory, the seven plentiful years in the land of Egypt stop now. It's at an end. 54. And the seven years of Darth came, uh, the seven years of Darth began to come according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, and in all the land of Egypt there was bread. Okay, so self-explanatory, seven years of famine started, like Joseph said. And then famine was throughout all the lands. But throughout all the land of Egypt, there's still bread. Because remember, he had in every city food stored up that would total up to a fifth of the plenty. Verse 55, and when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. So when all the land of Egypt is famished, it's hungry, they're hungry. The people cried to Pharaoh for food, for bread. Pharaoh instead says to all the Egyptians, You go to Joseph instead, and you do what he tells you to do. Okay, so uh, notice who's in control of the storehouse. All right, Matthew 6. Joseph. But Jesus Christ right here. Uh, let me read verse 56 and 57 as you go to Matthew 6. Let me wrap things up, all right? So I got to wrap it up here, and then we'll turn to these verses quickly. Verse 56, And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. All right, the famine is all throughout the earth, the face of the earth. That's the idea. And Joseph, he opened up the storehouses, his storages, and then sold the food to the Egyptians. And the famine uh, increased. That's the idea of waxed. It increased in soreness, okay? It increased in grief throughout all the land of Egypt. Verse 57, And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in all lands. So all the countries uh, around the world came to Egypt to Joseph why? To buy the corn, to buy the grain. That's the meaning. Because a famine is great uh, throughout all the land. It was very bad. Okay, matching up the final uh, four here. Who's in control of the storehouses? Matthew 6, 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? How about that? Notice right here that at verse uh, 30, wherefore if, uh, wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So notice right here that God is the one in charge of the storehouses. Malachi 3.10. Malachi 3.10. Notice that God actually said storehouse right here. Matching with Genesis 41's wording about storehouse. How about that? Malachi chapter 3, and then uh, we'll read verse 10. The word of God reads right here. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, 
If I will not open you the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. All right, John chapter 6. John 6. All right, what did Genesis say? The people had no bread, so they cried out for bread. So then they go to the one who has the bread, uh -huh. Joseph. Jesus Christ is the one who has the bread when nobody does, when you're crying out for bread. All right, if you're crying out for bread, come to Jesus Christ. John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. How about that? All right, John 2. Here's a good one. John 2, 5. And we'll close it off here, John 2, 5. They go to Pharaoh, all right? And then Pharaoh says, you go to Joseph, what he says to you, do. Same thing as the people went to Mary. Mary instead tells him to go to Jesus and says, what he, what he Jesus says to you, do. John chapter 2, and then we'll read verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. All right. Typology of Christ, uh, the typology of Christ uh, in Joseph. Very incredible. Very rich. The Genesis 41 is probably uh, the biggest chapter, if not one of the biggest chapters on the typology of Christ for Joseph. Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers and that uh, we'll take the things that we've learned and be able to use it for your glory. Uh, please bless the fellowship and everything we're about to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.